right, everyone. Thank you for tuning into the Honest Defense podcast today. I am honored to be joined by Robert Corn Revere. Bob is one of the country's preeminent First Amendment lawyers. He was my guest on episode 57, where we discussed his career and some of the major issues he's worked on, including arguing on behalf of Playboy in front of the Supreme Court, his defense of CBS television and Viacom in an FCC proceeding resulting from the Super Bowl wardrobe malfunction, uh, and successfully petitioning for a pardon of the legendary comic Lenny Bruce. Bob has had an incredible career, and I'm sure we'll talk about his work uh, again a little bit today, but if you want to hear about that in more detail, go back and listen to episode 57. Today, we're here to talk about Bob's new book, The Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Beholder, The First Amendment and the Censor's Dilemma. As you can see, See, if you're watching this, I've dog-eared and sticky noted this book to death. Uh, I've been traveling the last couple of weeks. This has come with me all throughout the American South. Um, and I just, I couldn't put it down. It's, it's more than just a history of censorship. It, it's truly a story of America. So I'm thrilled to have you here, Bob, to talk about it. Oh, Eric, thank you. And thank you for kind words about the book. And thanks for having me back. So I want to start by judging the book by its cover, because like I said, I was, I was traveling with this book. I I had maybe four or five people on, on the airplane in airports. You kind of see the cover because it, it really is. Again, if people can see it, it's it's a it's a, a provocative cover. Uh, and I think I've, I've gotten you a few sales just from carrying it around. Can you explain to me how you came up with that cover art? Uh, well, uh, I wisely took the recommendation of a good friend, uh, David, uh, I'm sorry, David Scover and Ron Collins, who wrote The Trials of Lenny Bruce. They have worked with a, uh, a guy named Alex Lubertazzi on cover design, and they recommended him to me. Alex is a genius. Uh, he's a novelist in his own right, but also does this kind of graphic art. And he agreed to do the cover. And uh, so I sent him a copy of the manuscript. He read through the entire manuscript. And I think really got what the book was about. And uh, so this was the cover design that we worked together and came up with this. Um, and then to be frank, as you say, it can be seen by some as provocative, had to persuade Cambridge University Press that this would be an appropriate cover for an academic book. And, and what was that conversation? Uh, well, um, one of the first bits of feedback I, I got back is that this wasn't exactly the kind of cover that they thought really worked with an academic imprint. After I showed them several examples of uh, covers, both in general and including some from Cambridge that had the image of Titian's um, Venus of Urbino, incorporated into the cover, they thought, well, may, maybe it's, it's okay. But right. ultimately, they relented. And uh, uh, I think uh, we're all happier for it. Absolutely. I'm glad they did. I love it. So let's let's start. I want to start kind of big picture and start with a, a little bit before the the events of this book. I want to talk a little bit about where the just the general idea of free speech came from. As we know, in America, it was codified in the First Amendment. But where did James Madison and the Founding Fathers first think to put these words into writing as a, a codified right of all people? Well, I don't know if I can really answer that question so much as, as much as to say that the framers and, and, and James Madison in particular all knew the classics. They all knew the fates of uh, various forms of government, uh, failed republics and, and so on. And they learned the lessons that, uh, that history had to teach. And one of them was that if you stifle speech, if you stifle the, the ability of people to communicate with each other, then you only embolden government to get more powerful. You only dampen the uh, creativity and spirit of the people. And so they came up with the First Amendment that uh, uh, was ended up being the first of the uh, 10 uh, basic freedoms that were enshrined in the Bill of Rights. And so, of course, this whole book now is a struggle between the limits of the First Amendment or the, the, the depth and the broadness of the First Amendment. Can you, you know, you use the phrase the censor's dilemma throughout the book. Can we first define what you mean by the censor's dilemma? Sure. Well, to, to sort of piggyback on your initial question of, you know, where does this concept of free speech come from? Keep in mind that through most of human history and through most forms of government, free speech was not protected. Uh, it isn't a natural thing for the human condition. I mean, it's natural for people to believe that they ought to be able to say what they want, but it's not so natural to believe that other people, and particularly people who disagree with them, 
ought to be able to speak their minds freely. So it's something that um, has to be learned. It's it's part of our our civic background uh, as a result of the form of government that we have and as a result of the Bill of Rights. But as the struggle for free expression in America teaches us, it's not something that sprung whole, wholly formed from the minds of the framers, right? It's something that had to be developed case by case as First Amendment jurisprudence finally began developing in the 20th century. Uh, and so there was a whole period where certainly the founding documents guaranteed the right of free, free speech, free press, freedom of religion. But it was only through a series of cases that those concepts began to take form. And one of those things that uh, we learned is actually, actually we learned a lot more about the nature of free speech by seeing the face of censorship, right? It's only when those freedoms were put to the test by seeing what censorship was that we began to learn what the framers were, uh, were all about. They weren't so much trying to tell us what kind of speech should be protected. What they were trying to tell us is what shouldn't be allowed. And what shouldn't be allowed is government control over the mind of citizens, over the minds of individuals. And so those, that, those doctrines formed more as we saw examples of censorship and ultimately courts began to create a law of free expression. And ultimately the very concept of censorship, censorship became unpalatable to many Americans when they saw the, the excesses of censors like Anthony Comstock, who we talk about in the book. Um, and so censorship became sort of a shameful thing, sort of an un-American thing. And that's the censor's dilemma that you would ask me about. The censor's dilemma is that those who are able to exercise that power for however long they can have a great deal of power, but ultimately they are undermined both by the protections of our system and by the fact that in, in our culture of free expression, censorship is looked down upon. And so there's sort of a, an inferiority complex built into the, the, uh, um, the profession of censor. It's funny, a lot, a lot of the book is about the ebbs and flows of the power of, of censors and about the arrogance of censors. There, you write about the anti-vice society in the late 1800s, and you actually include their, their official seal, which actually the, the seal of the anti-vice society included someone being arrested and, and taken to prison on, on one half. On the other half, it was actually someone burning books. They, they were yes. wide open about what it was that they wanted to do. You're right. This was the official seal for the New York Society uh, for the Suppression of Vice, which was the organization that Anthony Comstock headed for some 40 years. Uh, as you say, the seal said pretty much everything you needed to know about the organization, showing a miscreant being hauled off to jail and another person, a Victorian top-headed gentleman burning books in a big bonfire. And that was literally what the Society for the Suppression of Vice was about, because they didn't just arrest people. Anthony Comstock claimed, took credit for arresting and, and jailing over 3,000, almost 4,000 people during his lifetime. He also took credit for 15 suicides, something he was very proud about. Um, but they also would burn the books. They would melt down the printing plates so that even if uh, someone um, got out of jail at some later point, he wouldn't be able to reprint the books. And so I, I've said this book really reads like a novel. You have your heroes and your villains, and, and Anthony Comstock, I think, is the super villain of the whole book. Uh, my favorite story that you include about Comstock is that he prosecuted the publisher of a book about the mating habits of marsupials. I mean, that's sort of how <laughs> zealous he was. Tell me about Comstock, and I don't know if you, you thought at all about the psychology. You included a couple people's different stories about why they thought Comstock did what he did, but I didn't know if you came to any conclusion about where this fundamental desire came from. Well, Comstock was a product of the Victorian era. He was a uh, World War I, um, World War I, a Civil War veteran from Connecticut, he was not popular among his compatriots in, among the troops because he had a very moralistic streak. When he would get his liquor rations, rather than give them away to fellow soldiers, he would pour them on the ground in front of them. Uh, that was the sort of temperament. Uh, after the war, he moved to uh, New York and was working as a dry goods clerk. But he quickly took up sort of a hobby of being a vigilante, where he would go after smut peddlers at, uh, at night, and he would invite reporters 
to go along with him, and he would make his citizen's arrests of smut peddlers. Uh, this gained him the attention of the uh, gentleman who ran the YMCA, the Young Christian Men's uh, y Young Men's Christian Association in New York, and they essentially bankrolled his activities, bankrolled his trip to Washington to lobby for and succeed in getting a new obscenity law being passed, uh, and they helped him set up the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. He was, as I mentioned, deeply moralistic. He was. Uh, um, uh, as I say, uh, uh, very uh, uh, a product of the Puritan tradition. And his concept of what was obscene was in incredibly broad. I mean, it included not just anything that had to do with sex. And as you say, one of his targets was an article on the mating habits of marsupials, uh, but uh, anything that mentioned contraception, anything that mentioned uh, abortion, uh, this extended to home medical texts where he would prosecute doctors who had written home health manuals because it taught women too much about their own bodies. Uh, he would prosecute uh, uh, novelists, uh, painters, uh, you name it, from the arts to medicine uh, to politics, really, because he went after people who advocated free love. He went after people who advocated free thinking, all of which because he thought those were sinful activities, and therefore they fell within his definition of obscenity. And he was aided by the fact that First Amendment law had not begun to develop by this point. So the legal concepts within which obscenity law fit uh, were not formed, and they, were, they allowed a great deal of latitude for those who were enforcing the law to crack down on speech. Did he have public support at that time? Or was there people that were behind him? Or was it just the fact that there was nothing in his way stopping him? Well, it was partly that, but it was also the fact that this was part of a larger reform movement happening in the late 19th century throughout America. You know, this was a time for urbanization, a lot of change going on at this time, and a lot of technological development as well. And so there were a, a number of uh, reform movements, uh, liberal and progressive reform movements, uh, that were sort of marching side by side with this one. Uh, Comstock, of course, didn't play well with others, and he tended to believe that he owned his field so that no one else could, could play. But he was um, right there alongside the temperance movement, um, uh, trying to stop child labor. Uh, you know, a lot of the movements we um, associate with the progressive era were also happening here. What he did, though, was essentially, um, what, what he was doing essentially became counterculture, that as the culture moved on, and people were willing to accept more realistic depictions of life in literature, uh, as they wanted to see uh, works by the French masters, uh, as uh, society moved on. He did not. And so ultimately, he was pushing up against the direction the culture was going. So you, you mentioned that there's almost a dichotomy in his legacy in that you mentioned very shortly after his time, he kind of became a laughingstock. You know, nobody really carried on his legacy. Nobody wanted to be the next Comstock, at least not, not immediately after. But then you also mentioned how maybe more than anyone else, he's also shaped American culture even to today. How do you square that dichotomy? Well, he was both hated and feared. I mean, he was he was feared for the obvious reason that he could prosecute you if, if you disagreed with him. And he would take particular delight in going after his political opponents. Um, you know, people who ran um, um, various organizations who tried to um, repeal the Comstock law, for example, became particular targets of his. Uh, as I say, they were members of the free love movement, uh, members, uh, prominent free thinkers. Uh, those were the ones who drove him most crazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, he made them into targets. But at the same time, because he was almost a self-parody, uh, you couldn't make up a, a character like Comstock. He was also parodied throughout this, this period. Um, early on, there were cartoons in the illustrated comics about him when he went on a, uh, a jihad against the uh, New York Young Artists League. Um, there were all kinds of depictions of him uh, in, in uh, the, the popular press that made fun of him. He was off to give a speech at Princeton University at one point, and the uh, 
sort of young prankers on, on campus decided to paste red flannel underwear to a statue on campus uh, so that, as they put it, the wind would not visit his uh, <laughs> nether regions too harshly. Uh, and it cost them quite a bit to, to clean up the, the statue. But it, all of these things coincided with the fact that he exercised this great power. Um, one of the things that, that happened as well is that it made the things that he was attacking more popular. Uh, at one point, he was seen by uh, people on the subway in New York pasting um, uh, you know, coverings over an advertisement for an art exhibit at the Met uh, because he thought it was too revealing. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the gallery uh, managers were thrilled with this because it great, brought great uh, notoriety to the exhibit and brought more people in. And it's it's funny you see these themes throughout history. I mean, it, it, well, I'm getting ahead of myself on the timeline here, but I, it makes me think of Tipper Gore and the, the Parents Council in the '90s who wanted to st stick the parental advisory sign on on any CD that had bad language in it. And as a kid growing up in the early 2000s, that's all the music we wanted to listen to. If it had that sticker, that made us want it even more. And it's of course. it's funny that why why do you feel I, I'm glad that the censors are are this dumb, but why do you feel like they never learned that lesson? <laughs> <clears throat> it's really hard to say. One, one of the reasons, I think, is that um, everyone seems to think that yesterday's follies were something entirely different and that what they're doing in their battle for current day morality is totally separate from that. And that's one of the reasons I selected the examples that I did in the book. You know, I start with Anthony Comstock because he was America's first professional censorship advocate or censorship activist. I mean, he created his own profession and uh, he sort of set the standard and also poisoned the well for everyone who came after it. But the other, other examples that I cover in the book are simply showing how history repeats itself in various ways. So after Comstock, I talk about comic book censorship and particularly about Dr. Frederick Wurm, who was the uh, primary spokesperson at the time uh, seeking to uh, adopt new laws prohibiting the sale of comic books to, to minors. I talk about Tipper Gore and the Parents Music Resource Center, who in uh, the, the mid-1980s were advocating record labeling and also a healthy dose of government threats to, to back that up. Uh, and I talk about FCC regulation, both in terms of the affirmative public interest mandate and in terms of the war on broadcast indecency that was more recent in our history. You know, as as we're talking, and even as I read the book, it, it always seems like there's simply, it's just this clash of two sets of people with two separate views on how society should work and function. And it, I, to me, it, like, it seems like it just comes down to this history of Puritanism we had, as you mentioned, that's basically what Comstock was, and these this cowboy nature of America as well. I mean, you, you mentioned <clears throat> Ben Franklin, you know, he'd like to write dirty essays. You know, Ben Franklin's really on that cowboy side. And this is, it's a, you know, two threads that seem to have to be running throughout the history of America. So is that tension just something that's just always going to be there for us? Uh, well, I think it is. And I don't think it's just confined to the Puritans among us. I think it really comes down to, as I put it, that the certainty of the censor. Whoever believes that government power can be marshaled either to prohibit speech that they think is uniquely detrimental or sufficiently beneficial that they think it should be mandated. Uh, those are the people who believe, they're, that they're who I call censors, who believe that government power is legitimate for that purpose. And what characterizes their endeavor is that they're absolutely certain they are right, uh, that once they've selected on, you know, what they believe should be promoted or pro prohibited, then they believe that that can be mandatory for everybody. Uh, and it's not, as I say, just conservatives, as I, as I point out in the book, the impulse for censorship comes from all directions. And so I give examples both from the left and the right of people who fit that mold. So it starts with, with Comstock who had this Puritan background, but Frederick Wordham was an educated man. He was uh, a, a psychiatrist who led the battle against comic books. Uh, Alan Tipper Gore uh, did not come from 
the right wing. They came from a more progressive place. The same with Newton Minow as chairman of the FCC. And then you move into the more conservative manifestation of that and the war against broadcast indecency. So as, as I say, it comes from all directions politically, but what they share is the authoritarian impulse that believes that government power can be harnessed for this reason. Uh, that's why I always say when, when there's a people want bipartisanship. And I say when there is bipartisanship, it's usually a bad thing. It's usually both parties realize that they can get power by doing this thing. Well, as, as I often said about the wars on broadcast uh, indecency, which I fought in the courts for many years, uh, it is bipartisan in the ugliest and scariest yeah. sense of the word. Absolutely. So I, I want to talk about one of the heroes uh, in the book. I, I loved this mention. You didn't talk about him much, but you mentioned a man named Theodore Schroeder from the Free Speech League. And he's a man after my own, own heart because you wrote about him that he eschewed representing clients in court, both because of his temperament and because he believed the arguments made in legal briefs too impermanent. Uh, that's how I always felt uh, when I was practicing law. And that's kind of what, what took me away from that. You obviously, you chose the opposite route. You do represent clients in court. That, that's how you've decided that you can best promote free speech. Why did you choose that route as opposed to what, what Schroeder did? Uh there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of them is I, I, I wanted to actually argue my own cases and not just read or write about other people's cases and uh, do what I could to try and, and make the law go in a certain direction. Um, and so I found that uh, both very satisfying. But at the same time, I tried to uh, maintain a fairly active role in writing as well, as this, this book is a manifestation of that. I'm, so I'm curious when you said that, you know, he part of it, part of the reason why he didn't want to represent clients was because of his temperament. Do you can you give me a little bit more about that? What was his temperament that made him not, not the best litigator? Uh, I don't know much about that other than he would just, he would say that himself. In okay. his it's really hard to appreciate just how productive Theodore Schrader was. And by the way, uh, it's remarkable that today, both Anthony Comstock's name is lost to history, not, not lost to history. There are books about him, right? But uh, most people have never heard of him. Most First Amendment advocates I know had not heard of or did not know much about Anthony Comstock, even though he was the national arbiter of morality for four decades. And the law that he championed in 1873 is still on the books. Uh, you know, most of it's unenforceable because of the evolution of constitutional doctrine, but he still is out there. Um, Theodore Schrader is another one. He um, was a driving force behind the Free Speech League in the early 20th century. It was a forerunner to the ACLU. Uh, he was, he'd written just a vast number of articles and, uh, and books. Um, and if you read his stuff today, it is eerily current. Uh, the theories behind why we should have free speech, why we shouldn't have uh, obscenity prosecutions. It's really, really remarkable. And that's one thing that was eerily remarkable for me in writing the book, in that I would read the arguments that were made decades before First Amendment law developed. You know, for, for example, whether or not you should look at the merit of a work, whether you look at the work as a whole before you de decide whether it's obscene. You know, all of these concepts that are familiar with us uh, to us today were all being argued in 1870, 1880. Yeah. Uh, but it took the courts decades, well, until 1957, really, to, to catch up. Uh, and so that's what I find amazing about figures like Schrader, because he, um, you know, he was writing about this stuff years, decades before they caught on. Yeah, I was just talking about this with Jonathan Rausch, who wrote Kindly Inquisitors, which is almost 30 years old now. And I was telling him yeah. that book, and you're talking even way beyond that, but but that book specifically, I told him you could publish that today and it it would work just as well as it did 30 years ago. The, the arguments would make just as much sense other than maybe some of the, the examples are a little dated, but, but it, yeah. the arguments are exactly the same. Yeah, they and, really are. And it's interesting that it goes back now even to the 1800s. Yeah. And the other thing that's amazing about someone like Schrader, uh, he, um, uh, this really struck me about him when I first started reading about him some 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and that is, you know, here are people who were laboring case after case. He was in the background on cases, even if he wasn't arguing. He was 
running this organization that was for fight, fighting for free expression. And there was no First Amendment doctrine then. There wouldn't be until years after he was gone from the scene. And so imagine the frustration if you are a First Amendment advocate arguing in an area where there's no developed body of law and wouldn't be for decades. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to imagine. How did issues of, of censorship and speech then get litigated if it wasn't? Was it just state law that controlled those issues? It was largely state law. Actually, that's one of the things that drove um, Comstock to Washington. He had, in the 1870s, had been behind the prosecution of Victoria Woodhull and uh, Tennessee Clayton. Uh, these were two sisters who had taken New York by storm. They were, uh, they had Commodore Vanderbilt as a patron. They were, they made news as uh, the first lady stockbrokers. Um, they made news wherever they they went. They were essentially the tabloid fodder of their day. But they also ran a newspaper, and their newspaper, uh, they were among among the things they did, where they first published Karl Marx in the United States. But they also uh, took on the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, who was one of the most prominent preachers in the country. Um, and the Victoria Woodhull and Clayton were advocates of free love, and they thought that Reverend, uh, Reverend Beecher was a hypocrite because he had had an affair with a, um, um, a congregant's wife. And it wasn't that they begrudged him the idea of having the affair. It was lying about it. Right. And so they published an expose of uh, Beecher in, the, in their newspaper. That became um, a sensation in New York. Comstock was, of course, outraged. And so even just publishing a newspaper account of someone's infidelity was what he saw as obscene. And he saw that they were being prosecuted under then uh, local law. And when that failed, because the court ultimately ruled that the law didn't extend to newspapers, uh, he was sent to Washington to lobby for a new federal obscenity law okay. that would cover obscene newspapers. Wow. <laughs> he was he was a, an evil genius in his own time. Wow. <laughs> Uh, so I, I kind of first became interested in, in the issues of free speech and censorship through comedy, through reading about guys like Lenny Bruce and George Carlin. Yes. I think the precursor to those issues, and you mentioned this, was comic books, which is a, a, an area I'm completely unfamiliar with. And so I, was, I learned you have a big chapter in the book about comic books and the censorship that went on there, which I, I knew nothing about before this book. I mean, the, the, you know, they were saying that, that Superman was un-American and, and fascist. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why was it that, that they focused so much on comic books around, it was the early 1900s, first couple decades? Well, it was, it started, comic books emerged in the 1930s as a new publish, uh, publishing form. And it was a runaway smash development. Uh, everyone loved comic books. And it, it wasn't just kids. I mean, a lot of kids read comic books regularly, but also they were very popular among the troops in World War II. They were, um, it was a publishing phenomenon. And uh, there were comic books of all kinds of varieties, including very popular crime comics and comics about, you know, horror themes. Uh, and so uh, that started getting people's attention. But, well, part of it started with sort of a, a Catholic um uh, backlash against certain comics. You know, there were arguments that, uh, as you say, Superman was a fascist. Um, but also, increasingly, people were saying comic books were simply bad for the kids. Uh, and that took various forms, including that they would not uh, pay attention to reality or they become daydreamers or stuff like that. But then there began this sort of drumbeat uh, led by uh, experts like Dr. Frederick Wordham that they caused juvenile delinquency. Now, this wasn't anything new. I mean, this was the same argument that Anthony Comstock had made in the 1880s and 1890s against dime novels. And these were, you know, the cheap paperbacks uh, backs with stories of cowboys and Indians or highwaymen or, you know, all of that. And uh, Comstock simply maintained that they were laboratories of crime, that they would teach kids how to become criminals and was successful in getting laws passed, uh, one in New York, um, prohibiting uh, books that um, are, are publications that amassed stories of bloodshed and lust. Now, one of the ironies is that this Comstock-inspired law in, um, uh, in New York 
was struck down by the Supreme Court as being unconstitutional and, and excessively vague. The very day Frederick Wortham made his debut nationally as an anti-comics advocate. Uh, now, it wasn't that that law was designed for comic books. It wasn't, but it was designed to deal with the same kinds of issues that later the anti-comics advocates uh, would go after. And what then became the national campaign against comic books, at least by people like Wordham, were ways to re write new laws that would survive this kind of scrutiny that the anti-dime novel law got in, in the Supreme Court in 1948. And and you say it really killed the comic book industry for a few decades, that you, you didn't see the same kind of depth to comics when you had these laws going on until, what was it, maybe like the, the 80s that some of this stuff was repealed? It was, well, it wasn't so much that it was appealed, and it wasn't so much the rule of law in that, as I say, that by the mid-20th century, the law began to develop to protect various forms of literature, including striking down this, uh, this New York law. But there were still plenty of leeway. I mean, First Amendment law was developing, but it was still a work in progress. And constantly various jurisdictions, some statewide, some local, would look for ways to come up with new ordinances and new laws to put pressure on the industry. It was more a function at that time, in the 1950s, political pressure that then led the industry to capitulate and self-regulate in very damaging, damaging ways. So that you ended up in 1954 coming up with the uh, Comics uh, Authority, that was the Comic Book Code, which was a centralized decision-making authority that uh, all of the members of the association had to submit their story ideas and their art to before it would be published. And so we ended up with the very anodyne, bland uh, comic books of the 60s, the ones I grew up on. Um, and uh, it wasn't until the 70s with underground comics and the 80s with graphic novels that comics began to make a comeback. But it was one of the many ways in which censors ultimately help create the foundations for the freedom that later emerges once right. their grip uh, gets loosened. I have to ask you about my, I think it's my favorite story in the whole book. Uh, it's when the FBI tried to censor the song, Louie Louie. And people my age and younger, probably most of them probably don't know the song. I know it just because Animal House is one of my favorite movies. So I know yeah. it from that. And it's, exactly. it's, 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 to me, it was always such a this lighthearted, fun song. I was like, I was telling you, I was singing it as I was getting ready to set up for this podcast. Can you explain that story? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I remember hearing Louie Louie as a young kid um, and not knowing anything about the controversy. Um, and then, uh, of course, it becomes popularized all over again in Animal House. But Louie Louie is a, a song that has had a great deal of cultural resonance over the years because it was uh, the subject of an effort to ban it. In the mid-1960s, a, uh, a rumor got started that its lyrics were filthy. And, um, you know, partly if you listen to the song, it's hard to make out what's right. being said. And so you, you can understand how a rumor might take root that uh, this is a, a terrible song. But because people wrote to then Attorney General Robert Kennedy uh, that uh, something ought to be done. The FBI launched an investigation that went on for about two and a half years. Uh, it went through six FBI field offices. The FCC got involved. Uh, and the really weird part, well, one of many weird parts, is that about a year or so into the investigation, someone thought, you know what? Maybe we should check with the copyright office. And, and see what the actual lyrics are. And you would think that would end the controversy, right? If you look at the words and there are no dirty words, then that would be it. But no, they, they uh, played the song even after that at various speeds, uh, you know, people just pouring over it. No one ever found anything untoward in the song. It's really just a lovesick sailor's lament about wanting to, uh, wanting to get home to his girl. Uh, but uh, th th now there are reasons why the, the lyrics were unintelligible, and one is it was a song uh, taken in one take by the Kingsmen, the band that performed it. Um, they were they recorded it in a little broom closet of a studio with a single microphone suspended from the ceiling, and Jack Ely, the lead singer, had just gotten braces 
the week before. And so he wasn't being the most articulate ever. And he had to stand on his tippy toes to sing up into this microphone. And, um, you know, so, it, you know, the fact that his words weren't distinct um, can, you know, you can understand that a little bit. The other irony is that about 57 seconds into the song, the drummer says, fuck. <laughs> He, he dropped a stick and uh, just indistinct and in the background. If you listen for it, you can hear it. Uh, but because none of the FBI investigators were listening for any background noise that yeah. may have come from the drummer, they were trying to listen to the words that were being sung. Uh, they never heard that. And so ultimately, the FBI figured out that there was nothing there. They figured they couldn't find anything. And so the investigation went away. And the result of that is it made the song really popular at the time and then made it into the icon that it became. Why do you think they were so zealous in going after this one particular song? Was it just one person just decided, hey, this is going to be the thing that makes my career? Was Do you think someone in the band personally offended? They slept with an FBI agent's wife? What, what? It, it's <laughs> no, so hard to understand. It, I think it was a combination of things. I think it was the product of the times. I think it was really kicked off at first by the fact that uh, Indiana Governor Welch uh, decided that it was, he had gotten uh, wind of the rumors. He decided that it was obscene. And so he essentially banned the playing of Louie Louie in the state of Indiana. Now, he went, did it by underhand means. It's not like they passed a law saying you can't play Louie Louie. But he called the head of the Indiana Broadcasters Association and said, you know what, things would be better off for all, all concerned if nobody played this song. And so suddenly... Uh, the fact that it was being banned made people want to hear it, and then more and more people would write to the FBI. And then so one thing led to another, and this investigation just went on for two and a half years. Well, I'm in Indiana, so that makes me want to just blast it now even more. I'm going to go outside and put my speaker on. Uh, <laughs> another kind of big moment in history that you write about is this vast wasteland speech from, from Newton Minow, which, again, is I, I, I think I'd heard the phrase vast wasteland before, but I wasn't familiar with this speech at all, the effect that it had. Um, can you can you kind of describe the speech and how it reverberated throughout all of television broadcasting? Well, sure. And, and I, I use that speech and uh, the things that Newton Minow advocated for as sort of a stand in for this whole notion of the public interest standard, which gives the government a greater degree of control over the content of broadcasting than it does for other media. But I think it does represent that sort of mindset of the censor. And again, people will sometimes wonder why I'm using a word like censorship for someone like Newton Minow, who was, he was chairman of the FCC um, under John F. Kennedy. Uh, he was progressive. Uh, he wanted to promote good broadcasting. And so it's not the same thing as sort of a blue-nosed censor like Anthony Comstock. But the characteristic that he shares is that he believed that government power can be used and should be used to mandate what is good for us. It's censorship with a happy face, or right. it's a sort of an eat your vegetables, I know what's good for you kind of censorship. But Newton Minow was the uh, newly appointed chairman of the FCC, and that's the Federal Communications Commission. And he went before the convention of the National Association of Broadcasters in 1961 and gave really the speech of a lifetime. It's really, it's a, it's a great speech, you know, memorable turns of phrase, but essentially what got it noticed was he went to the belly of the beast. He went to the Broadcasters Association, all of them assembled in Las Vegas and said, uh, everything you do is junk. <laughs> you know, that I, I challenge you to sit in front of the television and to see what you're producing. It is a vast wasteland of, you know, crime shows and Westerns and, you know, all of this other stuff. And th that would be fine so far as it goes if he were a, a television critic or so on. But he's the guy in charge of an agency that grants and more to the point can deny uh, broadcast licenses. And he made no bones about the fact that if broadcasters didn't shape up, they could lose their licenses. Would people would, would complain? that the standard for the public interest was too vague. They didn't know what they were uh, they were supposed to do. He would say, well, why would you want to know how close you can dance to the edge of a cliff? And so it created a tremendous chilling effect on, on broadcasting. And what I cover in the chapter are ways in which over the years, this 
threat of government action and actual right. uh, decisions by the government led to a great deal of chilling effect that had a very deleterious effect on broadcasting. One of the ways in which sort of history repeats where he becomes the, the subject of parody and of lampoon came with the uh, the show Gilligan's Island, where the uh, the ship that the ill-fated crew um, is on is called the SS Minnow. Now, it's spelled differently from Newton Minnow's name. He had one N, and the, sh the ship is spelled like the little fish. But Sherwood Schwartz, who created um, uh, Gilligan's Island, expressly said that he did so because he wanted to poke at uh, Newton Minnow. So you bring up this idea of, of happy face censorship, and there's a lot of stories in the book about it. I mean, about these different organizations that aren't necessarily prosecuting people and throwing them in jail, but but kind of nudging people and saying, hey, we're just just voluntarily censoring yourself so that we don't then have to throw you in jail. And I, I listened to you talk with Dr. Drew a couple of weeks ago, and Dr. Drew kind of, he brought up this issue that I think a lot of people are feeling around social media companies and what, what they're doing. And again, these are these are private companies. They're, they're not putting people in, in jail, but they are very powerful organizations that that seem to have a particular ideology. And I think a lot of a lot of Americans are nervous or, or scared or just uncertain of what what can be done about some of some of the the actions that they're seeing these these major powerful companies taking when it comes to allowing particular types of speech and restricting particular types of speech, and there there are certain times you know even you you heard um, the the White House press secretary Jen Psaki even mentioned you know when it comes to misinformation that they're working with Facebook to get rid of misinformation and again I think people are they're not certain they can't vocalize exactly what it is they want to be done about it but there's an uncomfortability with these companies that seem to have a close relationship with the federal government that seem to have a particular direction that they're trying to push speech on their platforms. Well, how, how do you feel about that in the context of what you're writing about in the book? Well, I think it's it's really quite different in ways that would take a much longer conversation sure. to go into. But I, I will say this. I mean, it obviously is a matter of great concern to people what uh, kinds of speech they can post themselves, what the policies of social media companies are. But I think it's useful to remember they are private organizations, no matter how big or powerful they may get or seem, that they have both the ability and the right to create what kinds of terms of service they want to have, well, what kinds of what kind of community they want to foster. Um, and I think if you ask whether they should be making moderation decisions, I think most people would agree there should be some kinds of decision making. The question is, what kind? How do we how do we do that? Now, you mentioned what happens if these platforms work in concert with government. And that does become more concerning because if you have one voice in a partisan government that is uh, putting out what they think they ought to do and all of the companies get in line, you get back to the problem of government power. Um, and that's something that the Constitution has something to say about. Uh, but uh, I think just having them adopt and enforce their own policies, good or bad policies, I'm not defending particular decisions, um, then, you know, that's that's an entirely different thing. And let me give you an illustration of that from, from the book, not so much because I don't get into the social media issues right. in the book, but I do talk about that kind of government behind the scenes kind of thing. And, and that, to a certain extent, that's what was going on with the comic book uh, chapters where uh, you talk about uh, uh, threats of government action being ultimately what is driving the, the restrictions that the industry uses. Or in the chapter on music censorship, where you can say, oh, it's just Tipper Gore and the, her organization, the Parents Music Resource Center, that is just asking for voluntary compliance. What's wrong with that? Right. Well, <laughs> voluntary is a word that has a different meaning in Washington, D.C. than pretty much anywhere else on the planet, in that basically the, the formula is someone will say, I want you to voluntarily do this, and then the implied expression, or else, is always there in the background. Now, when Tipper Gore and her, her uh, fellow members of the Parents Music Resource Center organized in 1985 and asked for hearings on music labeling, um, it's interesting that the uh, PTA, the Parents, uh, Parents Parent Teachers Association, 
um, had been trying to get some kind of attention on the uh, uh, the issue of salacious rock music for a couple of years and had made no headway, but suddenly had an organization with about 20 members of prominent Washington wives. Uh, the LA Times estimated that uh, 50 percent of uh, PMRC's members were married to 10 percent of the Senate, which may help you help you understand why they quickly got a hearing. And so you have a hearing before the Senate Commerce Committee, one of the most powerful committees in the Senate on record labeling. And they would say throughout the hearings, oh, we just want to bring attention to this issue. But there were a couple of other things going on. One was you had threats to use the FCC to crack down on radio stations if they played any of the music that were on the, the PMRC's naughty list. And you also had the recording, uh, the recording industry uh, wanting to get legislation that would give them compensation for people who recorded music from protected recordings from copyrighted recordings. And so it was called the blank tape tax. It was there in the background. And so the Recording Industry Association of America wanted to stay on the good side of the Senate. So there was a combination of carrot and stick wielded by the government. Right. And uh, so it wasn't just a hearing to let, let's air the issues. It was a uh, basically a veiled threat. Um, and that's the kind of government in the background that is more of a, a concern and the kinds of concern that I talk about in the book. Right. Yeah. And again, we could do three whole hours just on that topic. So, so I'll, yeah. I'll move on, but I said, let's, let's go to a, a more positive topic. George Carlin is probably one of the greatest heroes of free speech in, in American history, his seven dirty words, which I, I, most people are probably familiar with the seven dirty words. You can't see on TV, that routine. I think what most people don't realize is that the causation is reversed from what they might think it is. They, because George Carlin yeah. talks about, you can't say these seven words on TV. And so I think a lot of people assume, oh, there was some list of words that you couldn't say. And, and he took that list and said them. And, and actually the reality is it was reversed that he came up with these words and then they decided to prosecute those particular words. Can you explain how that occurred? It's right. I mean, George Carlin, I think, is the only stand-up comic who developed a legal standard. Right. Uh, that is, the seven dirty words became the de facto rule at the FCC. And it, part of that is because, you know, he came up with this routine and then it became the test case for the FCC in trying to come up with a standard. And this is something that the agency had been trying to do for a little while, beginning in the early 1970s, because the, the law of obscenity was changing and they knew at the FCC, or at least the then chairman Dean Birch knew that they needed to have their own distinct standard. And so he put FCC lawyers to work to try and come up with something. And then George Carlin did his routine, Filthy Words, which had the seven words you can't say on television. And he um, got picked up as part of a show on Pacifica Radio in New York. And his routine was broadcast on this FM station uh, in New York. And it became the subject of an FCC complaint. And suddenly the FCC had their test case. And so they argued, although they were very circumspect about it at the time, they argued that we can put a, a letter of admonition in this uh, uh, station's file telling them to not do this kind of thing. So this wasn't the kind of heavy handed, we're going to take away your license threat that came later. But uh, at the time, they put this letter in the file. The case ultimately went to the Supreme Court, and uh, the um, Carlin monologue was upheld as the kind of thing that the FCC could enforce their indecency rules against. And afterwards, the FCC was so astonished. They had won the case. <laughs> they announced that they weren't going to be heavy-handed censors. They thought this would only come, come around as often as Halley's Comet. Um, and for a period of nine years, the FCC would in, enforce its standards only against the words on the Carlin list, which then led to you know further developments as the chapter explores. George Carlin, ESQ. <laughs> One of my favorite Carlin stories, I talked about this with Ron Collins and David Scover, was George Carlin, when he was a, a young comic, he was at a Lenny Bruce show uh, where Lenny Bruce got arrested and they were, they were arresting other people, or I think they were asking people to show identification, other people at the show, and Carlin refused to show ID. So they arrested him and threw him in the same <laughs> paddy wagon with Lenny Bruce. And Lenny Bruce yes. is sitting there saying, well, what are you doing here? And Carlin's like, I, I let them arrest me. And he goes, you schmuck. 
<laughs> exactly. No, it's a great story, and it is in their book, The Trials of Lenny Bruce. Yeah. And a little footnote on that, I, I recently saw um, a terrific uh, one-man show called I'm Not a Comedian, I'm Lenny Bruce by a, a terrifically talented actor uh, and writer, uh, Ronnie Marmo. And he showed me a picture of the day that um, uh, Lenny Bruce was arrested in Chicago, the, the Gate of Horns show that that story comes from. And what I had never seen before in that picture, and he pointed it out to me, is you look over Lenny's shoulder and you see a young George Carl <laughs> also being led to the paddy wagon. Oh, I didn't know that. I'll have to look for that. Oh, that's so it's funny. Really great. <laughs> so you, you write a little bit about college speech uh, these days, which I think to me is one of the most, uh, I think it's one of the scariest developments in where we are with free speech. And I always, I hate to be the person who, who says this younger generation just doesn't get it. I'm, I'm only 10 years removed from that generation. But I mean, the, the, you, there is quantitative analysis. I mean, they, they've, they've done these polls of college students for decades about their support for censorship and free speech. And it really seems like particularly again, in the last decade, you've seen a steep drop off of support for free speech and a, and a rise in support for censorship. And you mentioned that the coddling of the American mind, the Jonathan Haidt and, and Greg Lukianoff's book uh, really details this, but what are your, how do you feel about that development? What are your predictions going forward for, for these students who are kind of now growing up in this environment of, of, of pro censorship? Well, I, I do write about that quite a bit in chapter 10 in the book. Uh, and, and I, try to not declare a state of emergency about it. I mean, that you see these sorts of ebbs and flows over time in support for more authoritarian measures at some times and then not for others. Uh, I think there is a bit of a generational shift that has occurred. Um, one of the explanations for it um, is uh, you'll find it in uh, uh, Erwin Chemerinsky's book uh, about campus speech, where he'll say that with his students, he hasn't given up on them because he says that, of course, it's a matter of education, that uh, you have students who don't know the free speech battles of the mid-1960s that uh, led to the progress that we had. <clears throat> and they simply aren't aware that um, it was those protections for free speech that led to the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, the women's rights movement, you name it. Uh, they look around today and they see free speech as really just something that defends Nazis and white supremacists. Right. And so um, he thinks that the cure for that is, is education. I tend to agree with him, but it's more than that in that, you know, it's there, there's a sense in which younger people <clears throat> haven't had any direct experience with censorship. I mean, think about it just in the time that uh, you've been aware of these issues. There has been no real censorship of entertainment. Uh, there hasn't been censorship of political discourse, uh, you know, it's it's really something that people who grew up through the 50s and 60s saw firsthand, and, and earlier generations certainly saw. Uh, and it was only in more recent times, you know, think about it, you can turn on your television, whether you're getting your, your video through streaming media or cable or satellite or even over the air broadcast. Um, the broadcast media is the only one that is uh, censored in, a, in any kind of meaningful way. Um, and, uh, you know, so you have this open discourse. It's hard to appreciate the benefits of free speech if you've never experienced censorship. And so, yeah, I see some trends that I find pretty disturbing. I have friends who've gotten uh, very dis discouraged by that. Uh, but I think it's just a matter of continuing to educate people and to bring the idea that uh, however bad you think certain kinds of speech is, censorship is worse. And that's one of the reasons why in the book I focus on the censors. You know, it's, it's once you understand what censorship entails, what it will lead to, that you gain uh, a better appreciation for free expression. Do you think this is the best time for free speech in history? I think so, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, spend a little bit of time reading uh, about how far we have come, where people didn't just burn books, they burned the authors with the books. Uh, the idea that uh, certain songs were considered to be, um, you know, prohibited. And I'm not talking about just popular music that happens to be too racy. I'm talking about for political content and, and all of that. And, um, you know, I think because we have developed legal norms 
for protecting free expression that uh, uh, that has led us to a certain level. But more important than the law is the culture of free expression, which is both the promise for um, more progress in the future, but also the challenge that we have in communicating that and explaining that culture of free expression to people who might be more skeptical about it now. You write about how James Madison originally proposed different wording for the First Amendment. You, you write, his, his, initially he said, people shall not be deprived or abridged of the right to speak, write, or publish their sentiments. And with how we parse every word of, of really the Constitution as a whole, but especially the First Amendment, it's hard to predict how the law would have evolved differently if that had been the text of the First Amendment. But if you were rewriting it, would you have preferred that kind of language to what we have? I try not to screw around with what we have. I mean, <laughs> I think it, that's it, probably a good answer. Yeah. Although, you know, if you look at some of the proposals that were put forth at the time, I mean, Roger Sherman had uh, uh, advanced an amendment uh, to Madison's original draft of the First Amendment, saying that speech is protected when expressed with decency. And so you can imagine uh, how we would try and parse the First Amendment if that kind of language had been included. Um, yeah. But I think the mandate that Congress shall make no law uh, is a good place to start. Yeah, if only they they followed those words. <laughs> uh, so and we we do have such an established law around the First Amendment now, and you know it, it almost seems like you know the issue with censorship again is it's not so much government censorship, at least in America. You know, it is it is kind of what these private companies are doing, but. You you practice First Amendment law. What are the kind of cases that you are litigating these days against? You know, it seems like the case law is relatively settled from the outside. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because historical perspective is, is is always interesting. When I left the FCC in 1994 to rejoin private practice, I was really worried uh, at the time because I thought wow, what I really want to do is go and, and try and develop a First Amendment practice. But all of the great cases have already been taken. You know, all of the, the current, current controversies over things like broadcast must carry. Uh, the fairness doctrine uh, is, is history. Uh, you know, obscenity law is pretty well settled. Uh, defamation law is pretty well settled. I mean, what, what's there left to argue about? And yet today, whenever I meet someone and tell them that uh, I practice First Amendment law for a living, the initial reaction I get from pretty much everybody is, wow, this must be a great time to be a First Amendment lawyer. And I think part of it is we're living in an unprecedented time in that for the past 25 years, we've had a world in which for the first time in human history, we can communicate with anyone on a global level. We carry through smartphones in our hands, the technology that can give us access to a database almost the sum total of human knowledge. Uh, you know, it is an amazing time to be alive and an amazing time to be working in a field that deals with the protection for human expression. Um, we're beginning to see problems that were unimaginable in earlier generations. And so, um, you know, I, I I don't worry about uh, the fact that we're going to have uh, more and more uh, controversies. And, and the fact is, we have more First Amendment controversies because we have a greater capacity than ever for people to speak and also to get to get in trouble. Um, we um, I don't think we've yet developed a way to cope with or understand the nature of these changes. I mean, most of human history. Uh, we've dealt with a lack of things. Think of you know people growing up and starving. There wasn't enough food, and you know, and and you know now we live in a world where at least in our society, there's, people are worried about dieting and there's too much access to food. Well, we have the same kind of thing with information, right? It used to be people lived in a world in where there was a dearth of information. It was hard to come by, uh, and there were certain gatekeepers. Whereas now. Um, information is everywhere. And there are no, I mean, no, there are no, I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but the recognized gatekeepers are less prominent than they used to be. We used to have three broadcast networks. You had a nightly newscast that the network had 23 hours in a day to put together. And that was uh, a finely honed and professional product. Now, 
information is coming from everywhere. And the challenge is for us to find a way <clears throat> to cope with uh, that information and to reestablish some form of gatekeeping. So we have, you know, reestablish some form of moderation so that people know what information they can trust. Is that how you see you know, the latest controversies with Joe Rogan and his podcast? He has this exclusive deal with Spotify and people have been criticizing him for his statements and his guests that he's had on COVID. They, they recently removed about 70, 70 to 100 episodes uh, based on, uh, presumably based on a slur that he used. But again, th th some of it, I think, is, is some of what he said on COVID. Do you see all of this controversy as just us trying to find that balance of, like you said, like of gatekeeping and free expression? Well, yeah, I think there are ways that uh, the social media platforms have looked for ways to cope with this new reality that we live in. And I think that, uh, you know, you can you can praise some of the efforts that have been taken and say that others were not so well, not so well advised. Um, I think the notion that, uh, you know, say, um, uh, Neil Young has decided he doesn't like Joe Rogan and is telling Spotify you can have Joe Rogan, but you can't have both Joe Rogan and Neil Young. I think Spotify made the right decision. You know, they, it, it's a bad precedent to tell people that they have the personal power to silence someone else. Now, at the same time, Spotify can make its own decisions about what content they think would be socially irresponsible to put on. You can agree or disagree with their decisions. Um, but uh, I think that uh, they are trying to navigate a way through this new reality. Who are your heroes? Oh, <laughs> we've already talked about one of them, um, uh, Theodore Schrader, who um, you, you think about someone fighting these fights for, for free speech against all odds and in an inhospitable legal climate. Uh, it, it just... Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine, and you have to appreciate it. Uh, current heroes, I list Floyd Abrams, who is the legendary First Amendment lawyer, who uh, uh, is still practicing and still leading the field. Nadine Strawson, uh, former president of the ACLU, uh, who is a stalwart defender of free expression, very, very principled person and, and you know, amazingly smart. Um, there's another person who I sort of think of as my professional godfather. And that was a lawyer named Bert Joseph, who sadly is no longer with us, but he uh, had a practice in Chicago. He had been um, special counsel to, uh, to Playboy. Um, and he's the person who introduced me to Playboy and, and got me hired to argue the case that I did for them. Uh, there, are, there are so many people who I admire that uh, it would be hard to list them all, but those are among the, the top. So I want to end with a quote from uh, one another hero of free speech, Judge Learned Hand. You in the book you quoted a small piece of his 1994, or nine, I'm sorry, 1944 Spirit of Liberty speech, and so I just want to give a little bit of a uh, small quote from that speech. He said. <laughs> What then is the spirit of liberty? I cannot define it. I can only tell you my own faith. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which seeks to understand the mind of other men and women. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which weighs their interests alongside its own without bias. The spirit of liberty remembers that not even a sparrow falls to earth unheeded. The spirit of liberty is the spirit of him who, near 2,000 years ago, taught mankind that lesson it has never learned but never quite forgotten, that there may be a kingdom where the least shall be heard and considered side by side with the greatest. Robert Cornrevere, the book is The Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Beholder. Uh, like I said, everyone should purchase this book. I'll include a link uh, to it in the show notes. It's a fantastic read. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much.